So um, let's start with uh, um, the principal FIPSAM applications that we have and that we support with um, our dual beam or FIPSAM uh, microscopes. Uh, one big block is in uh, cryotomography sample preparation, obviously. So that's everything where we uh, try to thin down samples for electron tomography or cryo-EM sample preparation means you prepare lamella samples um, from ideally vitreously frozen uh, samples. And then there's a second block, which became uh, also more popular in recent years. That's again, volume EM. Um, so contextual imaging, um, not at the high resolution that uh, is offered by tomography, but at a, a larger field of view, um, allowing to image more context. So just for those not so familiar with it in tomography, the main goal of the system is to use the system's ion beam to thin down a sample for uh, transmission electron microscopy. That's what you can see here in this little uh, movie. It looks a bit like Star Wars, but uh, it kind of is a uh, plasma ion beam illustration animation here that shows the principle. So we have cells. We are interested in studying cellular objects on, on electron microscopy grids. If we want to do this by tomography, we need to thin them down to make them transparent for the electron beam and the transmission electron microscope. And that means that you always have to create areas uh, or kind of uh, so-called lamellas, um, which are in the range of 200, 300 nanometers thin. So they, they are then uh, accessible for transmission electron microscopy. And what we do with a sample in tomography, just uh, very shortly shown here. So. Um, we move the sample that has been synced with the focused ion beam uh, into the uh, transmission electron microscope. Since we cannot rotate our electron source around the sample, uh, we have to tilt the sample under the electron beam. This gives a so-called projection series of uh, different uh, images from the same sample at different tilt angles. And out of this um, projection series, we can basically uh, reconstruct a tomogram, which then um, allows us to uh, visualize um, the cellular context. And the nice thing with tomography is uh, especially that you can visualize both um, um, the, the structure of proteins as well as the uh, spatial context. So looking at uh, proteins in the intact cellular uh, neighborhoods and environments, that's of course um, one of the biggest prospects for tomography as a method. The other technique um, I mentioned before is volume EM, and that's also a traditional domain for the dual beam or FIPSAM microscopes. And here we have to go back to a different principle. You can use the focused ion beam instrument. So um, on the left side, you see the, the basic operating principle. It's a two beam microscope. So you have a, a focused ion beam column and an SEM column. So one column, uh, the ion beam basically is used to remove cellular material, the uh, SEM column to image the material. We can create lamellas, as you saw before, but there's also a, a fundamental other technique which you can do with the systems, which is FIPSAM tomography. So in this case, tomography inside the focused ion beam microscope. And the principle is rather simple. You also know to basically remove material with the ion beam, the, the beam which you can see acting here. And once you create a cross section, you can image it with the electron beam. And if you do that in a consecutive way, uh, in a, in a sequ sequence, uh, then you uh, basically also get individual images that you can reconstruct into a 3D volume. You can see that on the lower part of this slide, um, basically uh, it works for also cryo samples, um, which is great because we don't really need to stain the samples. It also works, of course, for room temperature samples. Those samples typically uh, stain them with some heavy metal ions to get enough um, backscattered contrast. We'll come to that also in a second. So these are the, the principles um, that we can um, use the system as well for. And here you can see an, uh, another example of such a data, data set on the left side. This is now imaged um, just inside the Hydra system. Hydra Biosystem is a new tube beam system. Uh, it's a cryo sample, uh, just plunge frozen sample, which we image here. And what you see is um, signal that comes from the secondary electrons um, that is detected here and uh, utilizing the plasma FIP source. I will also mention that a little bit more in detail uh, allows us really to acquire quite homogeneous 3D data from this sample. So it's um, uh, quite interesting to see that that works very well on these cryo samples. The right hand side, on the other hand, this is kind of a, a conventional prepared sample, um, high pressure freezing, freeze substitution, uh, resin embedding. Uh, there's, of course, heavy metals in it, so you detect the backscattered electron signal from that samples. Um, that's also possible, of course. Um, 
yeah, one of the key new developments and one of the new technology that we really kind of explore for life science applications currently is um, the plasma trip technology. It's a different um, ion source technology that we use. And previously, we only used or mainly used um, liquid metal ion sources, gallium sources in, um, in the life science applications, both in tomography as well as in room temperature. And now we have a different source technology, which is the plasma trip source. Uh, the difference is um, one source is a, a relatively uh, small point source and here with the plasma fit we have a very broad um, uh, source with a quite um, quite um, uh, high angular intensity that we can utilize so there's uh, also uh, certain capabilities which make it very interesting um, for um, life science applications which are uh, related to the, the milling or the removal, material removal capabilities. So you can really use it to ablate uh, large portions of material. We don't have gallium implantation. We get a little bit better data for tomography uh, preparations, not 100% clear why that's the case, but that's what we get from first um, cryo data and structural data that we obtain from uh, samples that were prepared with the plasma fib. And we have uh, a multi-ion source, which we can use. That means we can produce ion, different ion beams from different gases. You can see that in this image here, it's basically how such a PFIP works. So we have different sources of gases. They come from gas, different gas cylinders, which are in the system. All these gases go into a plasma cell. The plasma cell, um, there's energy coupled into it. The, ion, the, ion, uh, the gas gets ionized. And then we extract the gas towards uh, extraction optics into the column and focus it onto the sample. For different gases, you can produce different ion sizes and all the different ion sizes that we can produce um, have certain advantages when we work with um, biological materials. Um, there can be forms and samples which are prone to uh, producing a lot of curtains or for instance on, on soft resins. Uh, we have some effects which uh, we know which are hard to overcome with a conventional gallium fib. Here we can switch to a different ion, which is um, better suited to work with such samples. So that's the, the kind of technology behind it, the, the plasma flip source. We, in the meantime, also have um, quite a range of different um, FIPSAM systems that we can uh, offer for various applications. We started um, quite some years back with the Aquilos development. So that really became the workhorse for cryolamella uh, preparation. It was the, at that time the first dedicated cryo instrument uh, just for life science cryo sample preparation. And um, we also la launched last year a complete new system, uh, which is a little bit similar to what we did with the cryos, which brings really more automation and connectivity into the whole cryolamella uh, preparation workflow. So this system is purely for uh, cryotomography sample preparation. And we launched this year kind of a um, intermediate system uh, based on the Helios platform. So that's the high-end electron imaging column uh, with all the cryo hardware that we also developed on the Aquilos, which is now available on the on this Hydra Bio system. And that also contains a plasma fib source. So it really gives a lot of versatility, I would say, for both room temperature and cryo application. So we have a removable cryo stage so that users can uh, work for under cryo conditions at a certain time and then also remove it to, for instance, work uh, with room temperature samples. There are some interesting features on the system. Um, also new technology that we can use in combination with the plasma FIP source. And one technique I want to explain quickly here, this is the spin mill method. And spin mill is kind of a, a technique for large area 3D slicing. So you can maybe compare it a little bit to uh, scanning block phase microscopy techniques where you have a knife edge, which thins down your sample. Here, instead of a knife edge, we basically utilize the uh, plasma flip ion beam to kind of um, uh, mill down or slice a, a block of um, sample of the sample. Here is basically a room temperature sample. Um, we rotate the sample under the ion beam, not continuously, but uh, five different orientations are basically sufficient to thin down the sample. And we can then uh, thin down the sample with a precision um, of up to five nanometer uh, in Z. So that allows us to delayer a sample uh, in, the, in Z. And that's only possible with the plasma flip combination because that can remove such large area um, material with the help of the um, Plasma fit beam. There's of course also other techniques like um, array tomography that can be used there where you uh, uh, basically look at sections which are obtained in the microtome. So for this, 
method, you don't need the fit uh, column. So you only need an SEM column, basically. There's also a technique which we support with the software on, on that imaging platform. So that gives a lot of versatility in 3D imaging techniques. Um, here's an example for the spin mill technique, which is quite interesting. You can see this here is, um, for resin embedded um, cells um, in a clock. And you can see here is a relatively large area, which is delayed with the help of the spin mill uh, method and the ion beam. So you can see the cells here. And that's basically uh, this circular um, uh, marker here basically denotes the imaging area. And that's roughly 550 microns that we have here. Of course, if you want to take high resolution scans from such a huge area, it would take a very long time. So um, that, I think the advantage of such techniques, um, large area um, milling uh, is basically to localize regions of interest and then zoom in um, uh, later with um, uh, smaller areas and obtain from these smaller areas then um, data sets with, with high um, resolution and small pixel size, as you can see here. For these different frames, and uh, we go higher here in the um, in the pixel size. So that's actually possible with the spin mill technique. It's also a very interesting technique to uh, localize sparse features or certain morphological features within such a sample, which is embedded in a resin block, um, because it's always a challenge to localize the features, and it's also um, not new to you in the in the correlated field. It's the, the biggest challenge is really to localize regions of interest. In this example, um, uh, Clarissa Reed here from Ulm University was interested in localizing um, a certain shape of uh, nuclei, uh, nucleus inside the cells, so this type of kidney shaped nuclei. So, first of all, you had to find uh, uh, the, the cells within the block. So, you can see this is the entire area which we delayer with the spin mill technique. And then we can actually zoom in. Uh, on the uh, on the nucleus here, which is stained here with um, some um, uh, cytomegaloviarose coupled to a monogold, uh, where you can see basically the interaction inside the nucleus. And it's of course also possible to combine it with slicing view techniques. So you can use the delayering with the spin mill, and if you need a different uh, orientation geometry, you can also uh, use, of course, at some point the spin uh, slicing view um, milling approach. So that's um, kind of um, uh, comparable or can, can be used in, in uh, as well in such samples. For array tomography, this is also uh, what you know from before. Um, the key here is to have a software which is really robust in tracking the areas of interest. So that's something which we worked on on MAP software to really have a, a robust software which is able to track the feature of interest across uh, many different sections. Um, this one shows a low make overview of a section ribbon, which is a bit curved on a, on a cover slip. You can see the individual section cells here, as a sample from Irina Kolotov from uh, Lausanne University. And of course, again, you don't want to image the entire cell here at high resolution because it would take uh, very long to produce a lot of data, but you would focus on a region of interest. And um, in this region of interest, you want to track across all the different sections. And that's um, possible with array tomography in the combination with a software which um, can um, uh, track this software. In the next part, I actually want to focus a bit more on the cryo applications um, and um, show you a little bit where we are there. There's a lot of technical developments also going in there. So one is what you can see here. This is an integrated light microscope, uh, which we have uh, integrated to the to the system. It's available for all different systems from Aquilos to Arctis. Um, it's a wide field light microscope that allows you to do um, in vacuum uh, fluorescence microscopy. Um, we also have on the right hand side here, um, uh, this is the micro manipulator device. So this is the device which allows us to do lift out. Um, so that is the route to more bulk samples. And you can see here on the left side for the Hydra bio system, again, this is the plasma column, uh, which is a little bit bigger than uh, compared to what you know, maybe from the uh, gallium sources. So tomography samples are quite versatile and they can range from small samples where you probably uh, don't need thinning uh, in order to get um, uh, uh, electron transmission. But even if you start to work from, from cellular samples, even from bacterial cells, if you really want to have high resolution data, then you need to thin the samples with a focused ion beam. The thinner the sample, the higher the resolution. So 
Um, and there are certain sizes, of course, when we look, especially when we go to from the context of cells to tissues, uh, organoids, or even a bulk tissue or small organisms, then the sample uh, becomes much more complex. Uh, there's, of course, a challenge also to localize the regions of interest. That's why we need the light microscope and correlative light microscopy to retrieve the information. From all these samples, we still need to prepare electron transparent regions. So lamellas can be prepared from all such samples. It's a bit more uh, complicated when it involves, for instance, um, bulk samples, where we have to remove larger quantities of eyes, where we have to probably excise certain regions um, to basically thin them then uh, down for cryo-EM. Um, plus, we also need to freeze the samples differently because uh, cells on a grid to a certain extent, we can freeze with conventional plunge freezing or thin film magnification techniques up to five microns, maybe a little bit higher sometimes uh, in size, but anything which is thicker, if you really want to freeze into uh, up to 200 microns, then you would need to go for high pressure freezing. There's a new way to freeze samples um, into small disks of ice, which, which is called uh, the waffle technique, it comes from the New York Structure Biology Group, which is quite interesting because uh, um, it's also a way to um, freeze um, samples um, such as organoids or, or, or thicker objects into this ice disk and then send them down. Again, the downside is you need to prepare or remove uh, a lot of material. And here the plasma fib can uh, have also an advantage. Localizing features of interest, as, a, as I mentioned, is always a big challenge. So all the correlative techniques, they become more important than ever. So when we really zoom in into very uh, small regions, and we want to make sure that we are on the right spot. Then we need fluorescence information. You can see that here is a um, vitreously frozen cell on a grid. And in this case, from uh, this right lab in, in Wisconsin uh, Medicine. And um, what is labeled here, these are um, lipid droplets inside the cell. You can see the small stains here um, of these droplets. And if we want to, drop, to basically target now such a, a pattern of uh, droplets, we can do that with the integrated light microscope. Ideally, um, this target must be in the lamella. And um, you can see here with the help of the fluorescence microscope, this is possible. So there's a low mac overview of the thin cell. Um, you can see the lamella here. You can see the densities from the lipid droplets corresponding to the fluorescence. And then we can basically overlay that also with fluorescence information. And this becomes even more important if you now have a structure or a feature which is which is not visible. So where you basically look at a from the, uh, a phase separated compartment um, where you don't have a membrane which kind of uh, gives you a clue where, where to go. So if you really need to, to match fluorescence with uh, such a compartment, the fluorescence is very, very important. Uh, the integrated fluorescence is also important when we look at uh, bulk samples prepared in, in HPF planchets. So in this case, an um, example from, from Sven Klumpe from the MPI in Munich, um, uh, plunge frozen drosophila oocytes um, those are difficult to localize in the in the planchet. So the sample is in, in this three millimeter planchet. You need to excavate it uh, in order to get it ready into a clock for for um, uh, for transmission electron microscopy. You can see the planchet surface looks very rough, so it's not easy to navigate. You probably see some biological structures, but only the fluorescence really gives a, a very good hint. Um, what type of sample we have here. So in this case, um, nuclear envelope is stained. There's uh, nuclear um, protein, which is labeled here with GFP. So that denotes all the nuclei with the nuclear envelope. And now the nice thing with this geometry is because we look really perpendicular with the light mic microscope onto the sample. That means we don't have any problem with targeting geometry under an angle. Um, we can actually make sure that the, the nuclear envelope ends up in these regions that are prepared and uh, with the focused ion beam. And the preparation of these sites takes some time uh, with the ion beam because you have to remove some uh, bulk ice to cut out the samples. You also need to do some undercuts to be able to cut it free in the end. But all we care in the end is that the sample is contained in these blocks, which we then lift out. And once they are lifted out, they're typically put to a, a receiver grid where they are kind of thinned down for term transparency as you can see that here. So there are still a number of challenges in this process. Uh, nevertheless, uh, a lot of technical application developments have been made in, in recent years. So I think the overall method is quite robust. 
And there has been a nice paper on serial um, uh, lift out uh, published recently uh, from the Martin Street group, which shows that you can actually do a consecutive uh, lift out from a, from a large organism of C. elegans producing many different lamellas um, uh, all across that um, organism. So um, it's definitely a, a application which is evolving. Then the uh, other uh, example I mentioned before, this is Lysen view imaging. Again, this is a high pressure fusion sample. We kind of image it in the uh, focused ion beam SEM microscope. So that comes from the Hydra um, bio system here from the plasma fib. We cut the sample with the plasma fib. In this case, we use nitrogen ions to, to uh, expose, uh, to create a cut surface. It takes roughly uh, 10 seconds per slice. So the milling is relatively fast. Again, the imaging part uh, with the SEM beam, that's what takes time. Typically here in the, in the range of one and a half or two minutes um, for such an area um, at four nanometer pixel size. Typically, low KVs are used in the range of 1.3 kilovolts and some uh, uh, faster 12 times with some line averaging. Uh, that gives usually the best contrast. The way um, the signal you see here, this is secondary electrons, um, which come from the samples. So we have secondary electron detector, which gives us this image. And uh, most likely, the charge or basically the image contrast forming mechanisms based on. Uh, charge-based imaging. So you see the local surface potential plus maybe a topography component, which is in there as well. So that's, uh, I think, the best guess how this kind of contrast forms. Um, it's quite surprising that you can see here in this uh, brain sample example, which came from uh, uh, Cambridge, um, that you can actually see quite a lot of uh, interesting details as we traverse through this HPF frozen sample. So the resolution is good enough to also look in the z-direction at features that you can see here quite quite nicely if we look at the entire volume. And then there are regions like synapses or, or certain features of the mitochondria, like even the, the crystal, which can be uh, visualized uh, quite well. It works really for a variety of different samples in the meantime. And the surprising thing is, I think the image quality and the, the, the homogeneity or the, the the, the contrast levels became much better with the plasma fib. So we are able to more uh, uniformly image these samples with the plasma fib system compared to the gallium fib system. The gallium fib system had a little bit more scan artifacts. Sometimes you see them also here. There can be areas which are kind of overcharging or which cause this uh, black line effects. But in, in some, we can really image um, the samples uh, quite reproducibly with the plasma fib beam. And that allows, of course, to do some volume image analysis, like you see here on the HeLa cell, uh, where you basically can then also map the, the subcellular compartments, in this case, uh, plot the mitochondria here. You also saw the, the carbon foil. So that was a cell which um, was frozen on a, on a grid. And this is, um, also became a model organism ever since um, Ben Engel started to use them in cry cryotomography, um, chlamydomonas, the green algae cell. And again, here, this is a cell which has been plunge frozen on an EM grid. Uh, in, this in this case, we image it, or we mill it with argon ions. So we don't use the ion, uh, the nitrogen ions. In this case, we do uh, argon ions. So typically, nitrogen or argons uh, is basically the ions of choice for the cryo view imaging. Um, we use oxygen much more for resin samples, especially for the soft resins. Um, but in this case, this is an example slice and view from um, a sample that has been milled with argon. And then again, the imaging parameters are comparable. And you can see you can basically slice through the entire um, green algae cell. And the surprising thing here is really that you get overall really homogeneous contrast. If you look at the thylakoid membranes, if I stop the movie here for a second, you can see the, the thylakoid stacks uh, quite well resolved in detail. You can see some fluctuation in the charging. So there's, I mean, this is a membrane system which traverses the cell in all different orientations uh, while the electron beam scans it in a horizontal direction. So you're expecting some charges which are building up in these regions, but they are not preventing to basically get a full picture of the, um, of the entire morphology. Here. And with such data, um, of course, the goal is always to, to do analysis, to do some quantification. 
And that's where um, uh, Amira and the software framework uh, for analysis really becomes important. So here's an example of that data set visualized with Amira, where you basically start to annotate and segment um, structures that you see. Um, you can easily see um, there are all the, the hallmark structures visible um, that you know from, from uh, this cell. Um, you can really see and focus on a lot of details here. And I think the interesting feature with, with this type of cryo slicing view and contextual volume imaging is that we can now, of course, start to, to look at different phenotypes at different morphological or changes in, in the organism. So by basically looking at the, or quantifying the, um, for instance, the spatial arrangement, uh, the volume the organelles cover. So that's possible um, by the uh, image segmentation analysis part. And that's where I actually would stop this little overview about the hardware. Um, it's, as I said, there's many more things to tell. Um, there's really a lot of different technological things, focus that have been uh, made over the last years. And I think it's really exciting times for, for cell biology and in both room temperature and cryo applications. With this, I would actually turn it over to Max, who will connect um, what can be done with the Amira uh, software framework to kind of post-process the data. And maybe we take the questions in the, in the end. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Alexander, for this really nice presentation. Maybe we interrupt for a few minutes here and, and look at some questions because we might have questions on the, on the hardware and sample preparation side, and then we move on to Amira. So I see a question in this uh, chat from Ludek. Uh, do you want to ask it yourself or shall I read it out? Feel free to unmute and, and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, so my question goes to the direction to uh, <clears throat> localize the region of interest in Z direction with the fluorescent module which you presented. Yeah, That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I saw the question. Okay, <laughs> you saw the question. Hi. Yeah, great. Uh, so, um, great question. So, I, I had to open the chat first. <laughs> um, yeah. So, this is uh, as as you right said. This is, I think, the biggest challenge to really make sure that what whatever you want to target is also contained in the lamella that you have in the end. So, um, I think the the most precise way to do it. Um, today is uh, employing some fiducial based correlation techniques which can increase the targeting accuracy. What we have done with the light microscope now is we we employed um, a technique um, utilizing um, not fiducial beads but um, uh, certain uh, landmarks or fiducials on a, on a grid to do the targeting so we don't need to have a, a lot of small beads. Those speeds are obviously still a very good approach because you can do centroid fitting and probably in terms of ultimate precision, they are the best you can do, but you need to add them also to samples. So uh, what we try to implement now is a similar approach where we um, kind of compute distances uh, relative to um, a known fiducial marker that we have on the grid. And that allows us also to um, to target the samples um, relatively uh, good. But there's always a, a certain element of precision um, uh, which is needed because you, you you basically rely on, first of all, finding your feature with high precision in that. You have, uh, we have a wide field confocus stack, so we can use a focus stack to do this. Yep. We take the distance to a, a relative, uh, to a known fiducial position, and then we need to kind of localize this fiducial also with a very high precision in the SEM or in the ion beam image. And here it really matters how precise you get if you are really a little bit off or uh, that can mean that you missed the target. But what we did is we implemented this approach in MAP software so that you can import the Z stack into MAP software. You can basically define, I want to target um, a certain feature in Z. The coordinates are then transferred into AutoTEM software. In AutoTEM, you basically uh, can import this, this information and then you just need to basically um, place a crosshair on your fiducial and you get a predictive uh, prediction in the software where your feature will be in, under a, a given uh, ion beam angle. I can probably explain it uh, often a little bit more in detail, but this is what we developed so far uh, to kind of 
make that targeting a bit more um, straightforward. But I would still agree there's um, a lot of things that we still need to do in terms of ultimate precision and uh, increasing and targeting accuracy. Okay, thank you. A very quick last question. So do you use the one object, which is 20x, and what is the numerical aperture of the object? Uh, we have a 0.7, uh, mm -hmm. 0.75 um, numerical aperture. On, on the Arctic is 7.5.7 on the on the aqueducts and hydro systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I also actually have a question. Since you mentioned at the beginning that the choice of plasma ions also depends on which which biological structure you want to look at, and I was wondering whether using this more powerful plasma milling, you also uh, have to be concerned about the the sample integrity and, and and how you deal with it how that impacts it yeah certainly for for cryo samples you don't want to kind of really use the the full range of power of the beam just next to your area of interest that's that's clear i mean this the plasma beam to just give you a kind of comparison can go really high in the in the milling current so on a, on a gallium fib source we typically go maximum 60 to 100 nanoamps on a plasma fib system, you can go to uh, three microamps, for instance. It depends on the ion species. So really a, a very powerful beam. So in cryo samples, we need to, of course, use it with caution. Uh, so typically areas which are um, distant, you can remove with higher currents. If you go thinner to the lamella sample, you need to go lower with the imaging currents or with the milling currents. And then at some point, if you really want to higher resolution data on the lamella, you probably also need to go lower in the acceleration voltage. So low KV polishing will become probably an, a topic in the future. For the resin samples, I think it's great because it gives flexibility there. So far, you had to basically tune your sample for the uh, gallium source to be able to image it properly. Now you can actually select the, the iron source to be best, best, best match the sample. So there will be some resins where certain ions will work not so good on, like the xenon, for instance, on soft resins or hard resins are different. So here um, we have a lot of good experience with um, uh, oxygen ions when it comes to reduce, uh, for instance, heavy curtaining effects. So, but it's also a beginning. So we are trying to explore. I don't think it's 100% conclusive for every sample. So this is yeah. the exploration phase. So. Right. Uh, if you have some some literature links to that, or maybe you can put them in the chat, or that would be really interesting to which which uh, approach to use, which ions to use, which application. Um, are there any more questions from other people in the audience? If not, maybe, or if you can't think of one straight away, just hold that on to that thought, and we move on to Maximilian's uh, presentation, and then you can still ask a question afterwards or ask new ones that come with Maximilian's talk. All right, I hand it over. Yes, thanks, Alex. <laughs> okay, so uh, hello everyone. And um, thank you first of all that you are giving us the chance to um, present um, our solutions to, to the audience. Uh, thanks again for that. Uh, opportunity. Um, I think you saw now quite many very beautiful images uh, from our EM um, uh, products. So um, this is now where we come in um, to show what you can do with the images basically um, to get <clears throat> some quantitative data out of those images. And um, it is also very important for me to, uh, to make clear that um, um, we do provide the full solutions, uh, meaning we um, can give you the tools to produce very nice data uh, with your samples, uh, but we also give you the tools to um, uh, then extract some quantitative data out of those um, images. Um, so today I will be um, telling you a little bit about the software we have uh, describing basically um, the major features which are included in there, um, highlighting maybe um, several of them, uh, but this should be sort of a motivation for you um, to explore the software, maybe also yourself, so you uh, have the possibility to do so, uh, just to test the software and um, see which capabilities um, 
yeah, it has. So um, <clears throat> yeah, so as I said, um, this presentation now is sort of an appetizer for you to um, explore uh, the software also yourself. Um, so, um, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay, now it works. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, maybe I show you um, what is uh, basically done uh, with the software. So you can see here a uh, number of uh, applications. This is just a very uh, short um, um, a list of selected um, applications uh, we have. So you can see that um, the tool um, Amira software is used for different uh, modalities. Uh, it can be volume um, electron microscopy uh, of different flavors. It can be um, um, EM uh, tomography. Um, and after that, the tool can be used to segment and quantify the uh, data. Um, so um, basically um, Amira software can um, handle all the individual steps um, of image processing. So uh, starting with the uh, pre-processing, um, so we are offering different kinds of filters, uh, visualization, then exploring the data in uh, 3D, mm, then of course, segmentation, and uh, last but not least, um, um, quantifying the data and uh, presenting them. So let's let me um, give you an um, overview of uh, some tools we have included um, in there. So let's start with the image processing. Um, so um, what we um, focus on right now is of course to um, provide um, very nice tools supporting AI. Um, so we have uh, different solutions, for example, for quality enhancement of the images uh, based on AI. But next to that, uh, we of course also uh, provide the let's say uh, conventional or classical um, tools, which um, um, can pre-process your data and prepare them for the segmentation step in a um, very nice manner. Um, <clears throat> and we of course always um, try to design the algorithms in a very precise way, so that the uh, results you are getting back from from the software are. Um, reliable and uh, reproducible. Um, we also uh, provide um, typical um, tools, let's say, uh, required for electron microscopes. Uh, so we have designed a, a special uh, workroom also for um, our uh, devices where it is easy to um, process, for example, um, um, the EM data uh, to prepare them for the segmentation in a very easy way, <coughs> uh, which is uh, basically automated. Uh, in the next step, um, we provide um, um, uh, visualization of the data, uh, of course, so it uh, can be um, normal sized data, or we also, uh, of course, support um, large data visualization. And um, what I um, like very much about the solution is um, that is um, that you have um, the possibility to have um, different views um, at the same time to um, uh, basically explore the data in a more intuitive way and in a more efficient way. And we have also uh, numerous um, uh, rendering options depending on um, which type of data you have um, um, and which type of uh, visualiz visualization you uh, require. And um, um, we also try to um, make the visualization already uh, in, intuitive to have the possibility to manipulate the objects you um, are um, looking at um, so that you can um, also transform your data while you are inspecting them. Um, so basically, yeah, of course, I mean, segmentation is a very a huge topic to talk about. Um, I think we could talk about it for hours, but uh, I will try to um, keep it short here. So um, the very nice um, um, data um, uh, Alex already showed you, um, he mentioned that um, um, it was done by Amira. And let me share maybe a little bit of um, uh, details on that. So um, what um, I appreciate about uh, Amira software very much is 
that as you might uh, know, it comes from the um, conventional EM um, segmentation where uh, people basically used to sit down and um, annotate the um, images manually and then reconstruct all of those manual annotations um, to a segment, segmented information. Um, well, the advantage of uh, coming from, from that and uh, um, having the experience um, for many, many years in that field is that we have um, a very nice segmentation workroom. Uh, which is equipped with basically all the tools uh, one requires for um, easy um, and uh, intuitive uh, manual annotation of the data. But well, now we are entering a new age of uh, EM image segmentation, which is uh, uh, AI based. And I think this is a great opportunity for the whole community to um, uh, get segment segmentation information much uh, faster and in a more easier way, in a more efficient way. And of course, we also support this. So the result of this um, uh, data set, which you're seeing here is actually to, let me say uh, 95% um, AI-based segmentation. So the only thing we um, edit then maybe to clean up a little bit uh, of the data. Um, and um, well, I mean, if we are really, honest about our data, um, I have not seen really perfect 100% correct segmentation from AI. I think um, this will require some more work, uh, some more years to go uh, from software side, from hardware side. But I think the current status that we are able to use um, AI to uh, reach almost the perfect segmentation, and then to use some intuitive, nice annotation tools to sort of clean up the data. This is right now the perfect combination. And um, I think um, we do provide exactly that. So you can benefit from our experience uh, uh, of the last decades, but also from our expertise in um, AI-based uh, training and segmentation. Uh, which we have created for the uh, Segmentation Plus workroom. Uh, but as I said, so uh, in addition to that, you have uh, all the conventional tools available as well. Um, so uh, let's start with a very um, simple one, which would be a thresholding, but of course also what I should algorithms, uh, some enhanced uh, versions of them um, uh, and morphology-based morphology segmentations and um, many tools, um, um, associated with the segmentation to make the uh, results more, um, uh, even more um, uh, intuitive and, and uh, reliable. Um, so um, the next step, obviously, when we have segmented the data is uh, to quantify the data. And of course, we provide um, a huge number of parameters which you can um, then extract from your segmented data. But uh, this is an, uh, also um, visualizable uh, within the software. So the quantitative information you get from the segmentation can be also um, be, uh, be made accessible uh, visually, which is a very intuitive way of exploring um, the uh, results of your of your images. Let's say. Um, and you can, of course, also perform some uh, basic steps of uh, statistics uh, within the software. Um, so now I would like to um, sort of, um, um, yeah, uh, focus on uh, some selected um, features. So we had a great talk today about um, registration of uh, um, of uh, data from different um, uh, microscopy techniques. Um, so, um, um, well, so what you can do in Amira um, is definitely the, let's say, manual or semi-automated registration. So the principle, which was uh, also shown um, in the, in the uh, talk, um, which is sort of the um, standard process, uh, but we are definitely happy to learn about uh, new and upcoming techniques. Um, so this is um, supported uh, within the software, so you can uh, um, 
you can register your um, CLEM data quite easily by defining some um, landmarks. You can also stitch or fuse some uh, volumes. So this is uh, all available there. Um, the next feature which I um, would like to highlight is um, the enhancement um, algorithms. So um, I guess if you um, are trying to segment only certain features um, in the in the EM images, so for example, if you're interested only in um, uh, fiber, uh, uh, not fiber, but membrane-like uh, structures, or you're uh, interested only in um, small roundish structures, for example. Uh, we have dedicated filters to enhance exactly those shapes. Um, so the segmentation then afterwards becomes uh, much easier uh, for the conventional segmentation, but also for the AI supported segmentation. Uh, so we have used these uh, tools um, also quite heavily when we were doing the uh, segmentation of the Chlamydomonas data set, which um, Alex already showed you. Um, the next feature I would um, like to um, um, briefly introduce is um, um, analysis of filament structures. So um, we have a, a specific um, um, workroom dedicated only to this um, to really uh, track fibers at very high precision and to get um, uh, quite much information out of them. I will show you uh, during the um, at the end of the presentation, how it then looks like. And of course you get um, uh, some statistics and so on um, from that data. And last but not least, um, I would like to um, um, show you the, the possibility that um, we have, um, so you can implement your Python, um, um, Python uh, code or uh, MATLAB codes, um, C++ um, plugins, into Amira. So um, we're, uh, I mean, even if we provide a, a huge list of um, uh, features uh, uh, in the software, you can still extend that list yourself if you uh, would like to, and if you would like to have some customized solutions. And uh, if you require a very specific solution, but uh, you wouldn't uh, uh, want to invest time in developing that, um, we also provide some help with that. Uh, so um, if you're an Amira user um, and if you have such a question or, or task, please do not uh, hesitate to um, um, just ask us. We are happy to help. Um, so I would just briefly show you um, uh, two data sets because I think we are already over, over time as far as I know. Um, so this um, data set is now a um, um, EM TOMO um, data set. Um, so I wanted to show you a little bit of uh, uh, TOMO data um, uh, now, which we also provide um, microscopes for. So here you see a uh, um, DICT cell. Um, and um, um, for everyone who has already seen a DICT, uh, you know how, how nice these actin waves are and the cells migrate. And this is what um, is depicted actually um, um, here. So the um, actin filaments are identified um, then um, 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 in the in the tomogram and um, we use the um, uh, filament tracing uh, workflow for this. Um, and then the directions of the of the filaments are sort of um, um, color coded um, um, here <clears throat> uh, in the picture. And um, the second um, data set, which I uh, also wanted to share uh, quickly is um, um, this one. Um, so um, the um, um, Golgi was uh, here imaged with, uh, again, with the uh, uh, EM uh, Tomo, and then uh, we identified um, the entire Golgi uh, with the Amira software. So we uh, performed some uh, pre-processing first and then uh, we used um, AI to um, detect the uh, structures. Um, well, um, with this, um, I also would like to uh, mention actually that Amira software is not only for electron microscopy, obviously, so you can use all the 
uh, tools and features we have also for um, different other data uh, types. Um, if it's if it's um, some uh, small molecules or if it's uh, single cells or tissues or maybe whole organs or organisms, um, uh, we are dealing daily with uh, EM data, with LM data, or um, um, X-ray microscopy data. So um, if you're doing some correlative research, maybe we can deal with all different modalities which uh, you might um, uh, be using them. Yeah, with this, um, I would like to thank you uh, for attention. And um, yeah, if you have uh, any questions, I would be happy to take them.